Welcome to episode one of the Green Enterprise Podcast. I'm Leonard Alf, its host. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, entitled Environmental Action Through a Legal Trust Paradigm. You can find these conversations on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify, and follow our work at gre-enterprise.org. So today I'm joined by Professor Mary Wood, distinguished Philip H. Knight Professor, the Faculty Director of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center of the University of Oregon, and the author of Nature's Trust. This groundbreaking book proposes a paradigm shift in environmental law and is based on several key concepts, including an application of the public trust doctrine by which natural resources, including a, including a carbon stable atmosphere, are owned by all citizens equally as a trust asset, and the view by which the government is a trustee with a restorative duty, not only to prevent fu future damage, but also to repair past harms. Professor Wood has also been involved in several environmental litigation suits, also inspiring the legal action undertaken by a nonprofit organization called All Our Children's Trust. Her views on environmental law are as compelling as her influence in the legal arena may prove transformative. Professor Wood, pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be on this show. I'd like to start off by, by reading a brief excerpt from the preface of your book. I, I think I should just say right here that it was an amazing read, um, uh, written as, as poignantly as it was deep and, uh, and informative. As a child growing up in the 1960s and 1970s, I witnessed part of this natural destruction from the banks of the Columbia River. For many generations, the fields, forests, and wetlands there had enticed children to explore, and I was no exception but children today will not have that opportunity or anything close to it. Everything changed within a mere decade's time. Developer, developers tore up cherished farms with abandon. Four lane roads raised through fields, even as vegetables pushed up through the soil. Bulldozers operated from dawn till dusk, demolishing wetlands, creeks, forests, springs, every, anything that stood in the way of a developer's asphalt kingdom ripping up trees, tearing into soils, and bludgeoning delicate riparian areas. The giant machinery left no reminder of the ancient civilization that had once existed there. McMansions sprouted everywhere, as far as the eye could see, separated only by strip malls pimpled with huge box stores and fast food joints. Upstream from Woods Landing, the lumber mill ran at peak capacity, spewing toxic air emissions that often hung stagnant over the entire area. Pollution froth floated across the salmon spawning grounds at Woods Landing all day, every day. This environmental annihilation continued incessantly, all with the blessing of federal, state, and local agencies. Permits issued from these jurisdictions like rows of falling dominoes. Wow. Wow. So I guess my initial question would be, how did your upbringing lead you to environmental law? shape the ideas that then became nature's trust? Well, it's a great question because I do think our upbringing shapes what we do later on in life. Um, and for me, I was always brought up to be very close to nature and I just cherished the rivers I um, grew up on and visited the mountains I climbed in and the forests that I, you know, sought solace in. And until high school, I just assumed because they'd always been there, they always would be there in those pristine states. And it was a shock. It was a blow. It was an assault to go through the 1980s um, with what you described. And I think that we, we sort of assume that nature will just stay the way it is. The fact is that there are developers and industrialists and private profiteers who are always getting at this natural wealth. And it's always a battle. It's always a defense. And it makes me mad. It shouldn't be that way. Um, and it made me mad back then in high school. It shouldn't be that way. Government's supposed to protect this natural wealth. What is it doing? Handing out all these permits is it's actually protecting um, what it's supposed to protect against. And the other thing I might mention is that I grew up in a family that had an inherent uh, trust concept. 
in our family, we've always believed that um, we should keep honoring our ancestors and, and think of our descendants. And, and that was just part of our family culture. Um, and I thought everybody thought that way. <laughs> I thought everybody thought of their descendants when they took actions. But it turns out a lot of people don't think that way. They're not brought up in that same family culture. And American society in general just isn't, lives for the moment. Um, native society, and I'm not native, um, but native society, you know, lives for the seventh generation. And um, there is that, that adage, we, we don't own the earth, we borrow from our descendants. Um, and so that, that's just how our family has always felt. But <clears throat> the mentality of living in the moment, capitalizing on what you can have, and particularly the view that property is an asset, that has um, completely bankrupted our natural ecosystem. Um, property should never be viewed for its market value, period. It, it is just so much more than that. Um, and by property, I mean land, land mm. and resources. Yeah, wow. Well, certainly the ethical principles of the, the seventh generation principle is something that reverberates through, through the entire book and is, is perhaps what sets it apart from so, much, so, so many other, so many other um, pieces of literature on, on, the, on the topic. Um, but while reading, while reading Nature's Trust, one of the perceptions I had, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the legal paradigm um, the juridical aspect was an underlying element that, it, to be fair, went in hand, hand in hand with the religious aspect, the philosophical aspect. Um, and indeed, it's, it's that in, interdisciplinarity that it has pushed me to, to, to what I'm studying in the first place. But perhaps you, you, have, you could expound upon this idea and, and perhaps comment on the sentiment that I've had that, that law is, is fundamental to, to the environmental um, to, the, to environmental discourse, um, though perhaps positioning it alongside politics, diplomacy, citizen action, and entrepreneurship as a, as a transformative agent. Oh, that's wonderful. <clears throat> yes, um, absolutely. <clears throat> law, law is relevant <laughs> to organized society, or it should be relevant to organized society. We have um, the rule of law to keep us safe, to keep us organized, and to allow citizens to thrive. And um, so the rule of law has to um, be relevant to the reality it faces right now, as I've talked about in the book and, and numerous other writings. The um, environmental statutory scheme that was passed in the 1970s has just veered off the rails. It's not even relevant to the problems we suffer right now. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to that in our conversation, but, but I wanna come back to a point you made, that law by itself <clears throat> is not enough. Law is at its um, most uh, poignant sort of peak when it is consistent with the moral tones of underlying society. Um, and when there is sort of a moral pulse to protect um, legacy for future generations, and that moral pulse can dovetail with legal mandates, that's when I think the law reaches its strongest um, point. Yeah. And so we have to have a paradigm where the law itself is consistent with an economic vision, some economic vision, um, and also a justice vision, and uh, even, even speaks to the, the moral inclinations of society. Absolutely. On, on that point, yeah, this reminds me of a quote of yours, um, which, which addresses a, well, I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, you, you. You write it a point in your book, Nature's, uh, open quote, nature's trust synergizes with and draws strength from a quiet renaissance now sweeping the world. So I think that in light of what's happened since, since your book came out, um, we've, we've seen, we've seen an, an enormous flood of, of support, particularly amongst my generation, 
um, for not only the environmental, the statutory or the, uh, the outcomes that, that would be optimal, but also for the, the ethical sentiment. Um, so that, that being said, does that change your outlook and, and perhaps even your optimism as to, the, as to, to where, the, where, where we're going right now? It certainly does. There's just been a, an, an enormous tsunami wave of understanding and awareness and involvement by your generation. And it has just been <clears throat> so booing to me, you know, so uplifting. And I, th I think the point is that every single person in your generation has to confront this and be a part of it be a part of this renaissance, nobody can sit it out. And we are finding, um, at least in my, in my students and talking to young people across the world, we're finding people just from all backgrounds, all walks of life, really stepping up to this climate crisis and ecological crisis and saying, this is not fair. And understanding their own lifespans and the implications of what this destruction means for them and for their future children if they choose to have any. Um, so they are, they are just rising up and the diversity um, is giving so much strength to this movement. I, I really, when I was writing Nature's Trust, you know, I, I guess the biggest challenge I thought was not so much lawsuits, it was waking people up. And I think the young people have, you know, they just have accomplished that. They are, they've awakened the world to this. And that doesn't mean the job is done by any means, but the momentum is there, the ball is ro rolling. And these transformative visions of decarbonization and keep fossil fuels in the ground, these are big visions. Um, and they are just gaining so much momentum. They will be unstoppable. The question is, will they roll fast enough to meet nature's deadlines? Yeah, perfect. I mean, on that note, um, I must say, because you, you, you do mention victory, victory speakers in the book, and you talk, you, you, you make several analogies between what we're going through now and the type of, uh, the type of coming together that, that ha occurred during the Second World War, for instance. Um, on the other hand, and, and this is just a, a kind of a, uh, an, an open question I would, I would pose to you, do you see um, perhaps some of the, the weak spots or, or the, the places where climate activism is now lacking? Um, as just personally, in the past, I've been, I've been de-incentivized from participating in, in the protests, the marches, because of um, a perceived lack of utility, perhaps, in, in mere protesting, certainly the hypocrisy of doing so from within, instantiated within a, the, the comfortable lifestyle we all lived. And um, not to mention the, the critique and the, the ungratefulness towards the, the whole system that is, has, has given us what we have. Um, so you, you obviously are, are, are happy about what's been going on, but do you, see, do you see elements that are missing? And if so, how, how can current climate activism take a step forward? Well, that's a great, question. Um, uh, that's a great question that, you know, there's, in any movement, there's different elements. So there's protest, you talked about the protest, there's advocacy um, in a variety of forums, there's Vic speakers who just try to get the word out to their communities. I think that is so important. And then there's, you know, litigation, trying to change the law, trying to change the economic system. It has to really be everything because this societal change has to be a sea change. And so, you know, what is missing? I will say the one thing that is missing <clears throat> is treating our earth and our climate system as our home. Um, literally, if, if you were uh, Right now, if the smoke alarm went off in, in your house right now, we would not be having this conversation. <laughs> you would be, you'd be running around looking for a fire extinguisher. You would drop everything. If there's anyone else in that house, they would drop everything too. Someone would call the fire department and the fire department would come out with blazing, you know, with, with alarms blazing and they would try to put out the fire. 
<clears throat> that is the situation we're in. So is there something missing? Yes, it is a cognitive lapse in society. The smoke alarm is going off. The, the house is burning. And what everybody can do today, tomorrow, every day of their lives is they can bring this into the discourse of common conversation. Now, overnight, we saw people understanding what COVID is. Um, and everybody talks about COVID. It was in all the news. It still is in all the news. All the governments dropped everything to deal with COVID. That, to me, was so powerful. Now, maybe they didn't deal with it perfectly. Certainly, uh, our government, our national government didn't. But Every government around the world dropped everything to deal with COVID and you had private manufacturers and other sectors coming in and doing what they could. That's what happened in World War II. Um, and how did we get to that point? Well, it was the recognition. It was a light going off. That if we don't deal with this, it is going to be catastrophic to humanity. So I think that what's missing in climate activism is more of just the standard day-to-day -day interactions. When you go out and you're in the world or when you have a conversation, always bring in climate, always. Just like you would bring in COVID right now because our home is burning. Yeah, you, you describe what's, what's happening, the situation or the global situation we're in right now is um, open quote, a tenuous and epic moment, close quote. And, and um, this, this should lead everyone to 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 at least draw an analogy with with what's happening in, in the atmosphere um certainly your your book doesn't only talk about atmospheric pollution it also talks about ecological destruction which is often um even more heartbreaking but but certainly it's it's um carbon emissions that that pose at, at best a a mild civilization wide nuisance and uh, at worst, a, a, an extinction scale event. Um, so that being said, looking at, at, at the pandemic, and, and you, you've already listed a few of the things that have happened. Um, on, on the international level, governments have, have forsaken economic growth for the sake of, of public safety, and businesses altering their product lines, producing masks and ventilators instead of garments and, and cars. And um, even citizens coalescing around a, a government, or at least to a large extent, there are always exceptions, uh, around government guidelines. And as, as you mentioned, all this is reminiscent of, of a war effort and, and should, should set the stage for, for a transition from what is now a state of emergency for a very proximal and, and, um, and in our face threat um, that that leaves body bags in the, in the hallways of our hospitals and and um, and memor memorial services to a to a a less visible and more intangible threat that's 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 going to occur within decades if we don't if we don't do something. So perhaps I mean again, what what are your ideas on from from a governmental position? What what should the the governmental response to the, the pandemic, how, how can governments learn from that and apply that to, to the transition that has to go on now? Well, I think governments um, can, can learn that they have the ability to prioritize. Um, here in the state of Oregon, the Oregon State Legislature still hasn't passed any climate bill. It's tried since 2007, hasn't done it. And for years, I would get these legislative updates talking about, you know, important issues, school lunches, funding city parks, um, housing, very important issues, all of them, but not even mentioning climate. So I think the number one lesson to be learned from the pandemic for all of us is that we do this. And for government to learn, they have priorities. In other words, government doesn't just get to pick off the menu as to what's easy and what's politically feasible. They actually are there 
to respond to priorities. Now, if COVID were not addressed, people wouldn't have it. Uh, and that's what we have to, um, that's the same posture we have to bring to climate and to our, our earth as a whole. We have to make that the number one priority. Number one, because if we lose this planet, we lose everything. It is the number one condition of all economies, all human survival, all prosperity. And, you know, I think that this is becoming a priority. It's, it's not hard to get it on the priority agenda. It means that citizens just have to speak of this all the time. What I said before about citizens just bringing this up in daily conversations, that will change the entire mindset of humanity. And it's the easiest thing to do. I'm not asking anybody to go out and spend money even. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just suggesting that people go out and talk about the weather. And when they talk about the weather, talk about climate. It's the easiest thing to do with strangers, with businesses, with everything. Um, and once this changes, once it becomes a priority, then we should all be optimistic because we know government has resources to bring. We know government can focus on this. It just has not because it hasn't had the pressure from citizens. Yeah, absolutely. As, as for the executive level, because that's, we, we've, we've now discussed the citizen, citizen movements and how, how we should, we should enhance the public consciousness of, of what, what's going on. Um, so that grassroots change can and does occur. In fact, it's, it's behind um, much, of, much of the positive change that's occurred in, in our global society since the, um, over the time that you, you describe in your book, since the 1960s, for instance. So the, um, but conversely, at this, during the same historic moments in which, uh, for instance, homosexuals achieved, um, achieved rights that they, they hadn't had before, environmental law seems to have hit a, a dead end in a way. Um, certainly, the description that you make of, of the Bush administration's uh, failure, repeated issuing of permits to, to allow corporations to, to denigrate the, the environment, um, it, it reads like a, like a horror story. Uh, and in, in fact, is, is perhaps one of the realest horror stories that, that can be read if, if, if one thinks that that's also been what, exactly what's going on. Um, or what has gone on for the past four years with the, the rollback of, of hundreds of uh, environmental regulations and the packing of courts with, with climate deniers. Um, even the, the recent chief justice that was nominated to the Supreme Court comes from big oil money. So that being said, we've, we've now come through a, a, a nerve wracking election where we're, in a, we're entering into a, a time when hopefully the White House will have a, a president that is, 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 um, ex espouses, espouses environmental values. And um, a recent New York Times article certainly seems to suggest that, saying that, open quote, Mr. Biden's inner circle routinely asks, is the person climate ambitious of candidates even for lower profile positions like the White House budget and regulatory offices, end quote. So that, that being said, what is your outlook for the next four years of environmental regulation under a, under a pro-climate and pro-environment executive trustee? Well, I think we're at a crossroads. <clears throat> um, we cannot just try to put him empty back together again. The Trump administration basically threw environmental law out the window. It shattered, uh, meaning that <clears throat> the Trump administration rolled back all these environmental regulations. But as my book really showed, um, that system was dysfunctional. That system was being used <laughs> to promote the fossil fuel industry. And it was dysfunctional in a way that was very serious to us because it just didn't protect the resources. So if we try to put back the Obama era regulations, we will fail because we're not addressing the systemic dysfunction of agencies acting 
for the political benefit of industries. And I'm not talking about just the executive or the federal level, but also the state level. So we have to have a different concept. And um, I hope what President Biden will do is not focus all the attention on just piecing back together broken regulations. There are some that are really crucial, like the California tailpipe standards. Those are really crucial because they have to do with automobiles and th those are regulations with a whole lot of force. Um, mileage standards, same thing. <clears throat> but what I hope you will do is focus on decarbonizing and retiring the fossil fuel industry altogether. There is colossal damage, not only to the life systems on this earth, but also just to, to the landscapes, the communities, the waterways that people rely on to drink water from. The fossil fuel industry um, has destroyed so many resources on a localized level and on a planetary level. It, it's time is over. It has to be retired. And that is the crossroads that we're at. If you retire the fossil fuel industry, which we have to do, we have to decarbonize totally by 2050 and we have to achieve, according to top on the world and as expressed by the UN chief himself, we have to achieve a 45% reduction in, in carbon emissions in 10 years <laughs> by 2000. 30, that's actually nine years. You can't do that without being on a very strong path towards retiring the fossil fuel industry. If we do that, <clears throat> we will do so much. We will turn the ship. We will have renewable energy that is clean, that is more affordable to communities. Hopefully we won't be under the dominion of these fossil fuel companies and our democracy will thrive more. We'll start restoring the waterways, the landscapes that have been um, mined and blown up and uh, demolished. We will start restoring and we've got to hold that industry accountable for that restoration. But the fossil fuel industry basically hung on way beyond its lifetime. It's a dinosaur industry, literally. It's been around since the industrial revolution. Um, there's been technology that society should have grown to adapt, like the electric car and like, um, you know, solar. We've known about this technology for a very long time. We should have moved on by now. And the reason we didn't is because the fossil fuel industry had a grip on government through campaign contributions. And so society um, grew beyond its, its, its coat. And now we're feeling the effects. We've got to find new clothing for society, a whole new energy system. But once we do, that's gonna be so optimistic. The momentum is just going to fly um, in a different direction. So President Biden and Vice President Harris have a crossroads. If they're just gonna go try to piece back broken regulations, we're doomed. <laughs> we don't have time to do that. But if they keep fossil fuels in the ground and they keep us on the path towards retiring fossil fuels, we have a lot to look forward to. And this means jobs for young people. It means that the fossil fuel jobs need to convert to renewable energy jobs. We have to have jobs and justice as a part of this vision. And it's a wonderful vision because building the infrastructure for a non-fossil fuel economy is going to take a lot of money and a lot of jobs. And so the fossil fuel workers who, who never brought on this problem themselves, they have to be part of the solution. And I think they want to be, but they want to be included. They want their interests um, attended to, and that's fair. Yeah, that's right. David, David Wallace Wells makes a, a similar point and certainly talks quite a lot about the fossil fuel industry in, um, in his book, An Uninhabitable Earth. And one of the, the analogies that really struck me there was that between the fossil fuel industry and, and the slavers, in, uh, in, um, in America, how both, both groups of individuals had trillions of dollars, literally trillions of dollars in, in assets that they couldn't morally continue to use. And yet, uh, again, you, you, you even quote Bill McGibbon as, as saying that the fossil fuel industry, the public enemy number one has 
both the profit motive and means to release a quantity of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere that would completely dysregulate our climate system. So that being said, the first thing I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing about and that, that perhaps you have a new perspective on since you, you first wrote your, you first wrote Nature's Trust might be how we proceed in, in shaking the hold of, um, of the, these, of these predatory industries. Um, you describe them as dinosaurs. I, I think of them as piranhas as well. Um, from, from, from office. So how to shake off industry capture, but also um, how we can make the same shift that happened uh, in, in, in American history without having, without the recourse to civil war that, that was necessary to, to, to shake off, um, to, to end the age of the era of slavery. Um, and perhaps on this note, we could, we could uh, use this as a, as a good time to, to discuss atmospheric recovery litigation and, and um, more specifically cli uh, sky cleanup, which is, is the, the most recent thing that you, you've been involved in and, and uh, perhaps where you are today with that. Great. Um, so what do we do? I, I kind of think there's a, a four-pronged approach. One is um, trying to force governments to stop giving out these permits and have a plan <clears throat> to decarbonize. And that is what our Children's Trust, which I'm not affiliated with, um, but they're, they have these losses, which we might talk about more, against government to force a plan to decarbonize. That is so important. These, uh, these losses are brought on behalf of youth. I'm not a litigating attorney. I, I teach law, I don't practice law, but um, those lawsuits really get at the problem of government. Number two, citizens um, should, I think, devote their time to keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Just wherever fossil fuels um, are um, proposed to be developed, whether there's an export facility proposed on the Columbia River where, near where I live, or a coal mine, a new coal mine proposed in Appalachia, wherever, or some, some coal mine in Australia. Citizens have to swarm those proposals like a swarm of bees. And they, when they swarm those proposals, they win. Citizens win when they devote attention to these things. Um, and, and I need to get back to the other two tracks, but I just want to point out that our environmental laws do require permits. And the permits um, have been derailed by agencies that just give them out for industry. But when the citizens pay attention, they win because of this. There are, every permit sets up kind of a playing field. And let's say a facility needs a dozen permits to go through, or a coal mine needs a dozen permits to go through. If citizens win on just one of those playing fields, they stop the project. Industry has to win on each one of the permits. The citizens only have to win on one. And so we've seen this turnaround on the second level, stopping fossil fuel projects. We've seen a turnaround. We've seen a court stop oil going through the pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. We've seen the Keystone Pipeline shut down. We've seen uh, Jordan Cove here at the coast of Oregon still not get his permits after years. And that's because citizens have fought. So, so the second plane, first plane was go after government. Second plane is shutting down fossil fuels where, where they're proposed to be developed. Citizens can do that on a localized level. The third plane is building renewable energy systems, building new ways of, um, of providing for transportation and food and, and waste by not using fossil fuels. And citizens all around the world are doing this and getting their businesses to do this. And the fourth, is what you um, suggested. And it's an approach I've developed since writing Nature's Trust called Atmospheric Recovery Litigation in the Sky Trust. <clears throat> so the fourth is we have to clean up the sky. It's like, it, it has something like a massive oil dump in the ocean. Now, if an oil company like Exxon or BP um, had a tanker or a facility in the ocean that just released millions of gallons of oil 
nobody would think twice about forcing that company to clean that up. And so we have to force the fossil fuel companies to clean up their oil spill in the sky. We have to have a sky cleanup, just like we would have an ocean cleanup. And legally, it's just very simple. We would sue, we would get governments to sue um, these big industries for natural resource damages. That's what they're called. And rather than sue for um, damages to fish and wildlife in the ocean, we sue for pollution in the sky. And then we take those damages and a court would put those in a trust fund, which I'm calling the Sky Trust. And then the Sky Trust would disperse that money to um, sectors that can clean up the sky. It's, it's, it's really just uh, patterned off a of basic oil spill cleanup. So the next question is, um, what could clean up the sky right now? Well, there may be some technology coming around, you know, some big, great vacuum cleaners. We don't have that yet, but we do have nature's engines. And it turns out that soils and plants are the, the greatest engines right now for cleaning up the sky. So if we reforest areas, if we restore wetlands, if we, if we back off from all this natural destruction and we start restoring the soils uh, with different agricultural practices, not using pesticides and tilling methods and herbicides, going back to the old ways, then we um, jumpstart turbocharge nature's engines of drawing carbon down from the sky and um, we, we get on a path towards regaining balance. And we have to do that because even if we stopped all emissions tomorrow, we stopped, we would still have climate crisis and we'd still um, have these growing catastrophes because of the carbon already in the atmosphere. We've already got the oil spill. So we've got to um, scrub carbon out of the atmosphere using natural climate solutions until we get something better. And we have to get the carbon down from 410 um, parts per million in the atmosphere to 350. 350 is the highest, safest level. And so we've got to clean up that increment in that way. So I mentioned four tracks, atmospheric trust litigation, citizens um, fighting fossil fuel development everywhere it occurs, businesses and communities rebuild or building decarbonization energy systems, and then fourth, suing the fossil fuel companies for all their remaining assets to clean up the mess that they've caused in the sky. And by the way, cleaning up that mess will do two other things. Number one, it will restore all of these resources that provide services to humanity that have been lost because of devastation from, from agricultural and forestry sectors and others. So we'll restore those and we'll see a growing of natural abundance. Your generation will be on a different track than my generation was. My generation has been on this track towards a dead end devastation. If we start restoring these things, your generation, while, while it has some really uh, horrendous harms facing it will at least be on the path towards recovery at least that's something but the second thing it will do is create jobs and invigorate local communities and advance justice because when you start paying uh, the forestry sector and ranchers um, you know ranchers and loggers and farmers and you start paying them from from exxon or bp or shell profits to actually clean up the sky. Those communities get money infused in them and people get jobs. So it's an economic strategy as well as an environmental strategy. Yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, that's also so on, on spot. And what's more, it also, uh, I, I feel like it responds to one of the questions I, I had meant to ask you, which is how can environmentally, uh, an environmentally versed person today not fall prey to to hopelessness um, based on on their their decision to to face reality and to, to look at things as they really are um, on that note and, and really what what I, I with with conversations like these will will try to achieve is to advance perhaps 
something that ties in with the third prong of what you, you discuss. So uh, I'm, I'm talking about the, the construction of a new of a new economic system capable of, of sustaining growth um, despite having divorced from from fossil fuels. There's as as you lay out in your book, there's a, a current narrative that that economic prosperity depends on continuous growth and that it, that growth in turn is is inextricably tied to uh, to endless consumption of fossil fuels, um, not to mention simply um, a society of waste and a society of consumption and, and expansion. Mm, but on that note, in order to establish, in order to, to go forth with with enterprise at this point is faced with a with a predatory market competing against against businesses without the ethical constraints and at the same time with the with the the benefits of of uh, of a giant corporation being able to capture industry and send million dollar lobbyists to 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 Washington D.C. So I, I suppose my question from all this is how can these disruptive technologies and and disruptive and at the same time traditional methods get on their feet right now while competing with colluding and unethical businesses and how can more importantly law uh, and the, the legal aspect incentivize that transformation well that's a great question um so yeah growth where it's predicated on destruction is like cancer growth where it's predicated on healing is restorative so we have to switch government support from destructive industries to restorative industries we still you know ultimately down the road and it's not my job it's the job of economists have to rethink this whole growth mentality and the corporate structure it's the corporate structure that have led it, has led us to this point corporations are more powerful than the founders of this nation ever realized they could be they outlive everybody um, but we have but, but that's another conversation perhaps for another day we, we have to think about our our economic structure um at least in terms of the role of corporations in our society but having said that um your specific question was how does a company that seeks to be restorative compete against these dinosaur powerful predators that have a lock on the government system. The reason the fossil fuel industry has endured for so long, as I said before, is not because it's a good industry. Um, it is a very destructive industry, but it has formed a lock on government because over time it has amassed the resources necessary to give incredible campaign contributions <clears throat> to presidents, and people in legislatures and governors. In, I'm, I'm just talking about the American system, but this happens everywhere around the world. And when these campaign contributions are given by a major corporation, let's, let's pretend I'm a senator, and I just got a, a senator from Oklahoma, and I just got a contribution for a million dollars from some corporate PAC, you know, um, political, political action committee. Um, and I know it's tied to a corporation. I get in office and I'm supposed to vote on whether or not to open public lands to oil drilling that this corporation wants to do. I just got a million dollars from this corporation. Am I biased? <laughs> Let me ask you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I am. Yeah. This corporate donor wants payback. And so my only payback to this corporation can be my use of public lands and resources and my use of the rule of law or, or my legislative power to benefit that corporation. It is as simple as that. And every American knows this. <laughs> every American knows that's what's wrong with our system. <laughs> and so when you say, when you ask, how do we, um, allow restorative corporations the space to get off the ground even when you're dealing with the whole corrupt system how do you even allow that that is the question is <laughs> is how you unlock 
that vice grip that the fossil fuel companies have on the, the American political system and really every system around the world. And so I bring in the public trust. The rule of law is relevant here. The public trust principle, which forms really the focus of my book, Nature's Trust, is an ancient principle that is present in the United States and many countries around the world even most, and, it ev and, and every state in this country. And it's very basic. It says that, and you don't have to invent it. You just have to pull it off the shelf because it was sort of hidden in the last 50 years of statutory law. It just, it just wasn't paid attention to. But it's there. It's in every state's legal system and the federal legal system as well. And all it says is that for crucial natural resources like air and waters and wildlife, navigable streams, government must be a trustee of these resources to protect them for present and future generations. It must treat it as an ecological endowment that is to endure over time. Because if you don't treat it that way, then you leave it open, all this wealth, to exactly what I said, to legislators who will give it away to benefit their corporate allies. So courts have throughout this country come in and enforce the public trust when a government official was about to privatize some resource, natural resource belonging to the public. This is an extraordinary principle. It's got constitutional force, but it is limited to the natural resources that are crucial to our survival. So you're not gonna be able to use this principle, the public trust in you know, areas of social um, policy or economic policy. It doesn't work there. It's only for natural commonwealth, ecological wealth. And so what you could do with this principle is a, a litigant could, or a group of litigants could come in, back to my example, could come in and sue to set aside senators, the senator's decision in that particular legislative action where that senator was obviously biased or had the potential for bias that senator under the public trust would have to recuse herself. And the reason is a core principle of any trust is the duty of loyalty. A trustee having so much power over wealth has to maintain complete and the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries of the public trust are, as every court has said, the present and future generations of citizens, not the corporations. And so you could imagine a lawsuit against um, seeking to invalidate that legislation on the grounds that some of the trustees were biased and violated the duty of loyalty and it must be set aside and the decision be considered without that bias. That is not that hard to envision. And that is a legal way, it hasn't been tried yet, but I think it will. It is a legal way of attacking the rot in our political system, attacking it, getting at the core. You can't right now attack it from the other end. You, you either hack it, the contributions coming in or the decisions going out. I'm suggesting attack the decisions going out because the co campaign contributions coming in are legalized by the Supreme Court under the Citizens United decision, which basically allows unlimited campaign contributions by corporations saying that they're people and that they have First Amendment rights. It's been very criticized, but until you get at that, these campaign contributions will keep streaming in. So I'm suggesting get at the real root of the problem, attacking decisions that are tainted by those. And you could do that on the state level, the county level, even attack um, decisions from uh, port, port facilities. You know, these ports along the Pacific Northwest coast are governed by port commissioners those port commissioners get campaign contributions from the very corporations that want their facilities established to ship fossil fuels through Northwest ports to Asian markets. So you could bring the same principle there. Yeah. Well, your, your mentioning Asia is, is, uh, is quite appropriate because after all, and, and perhaps if we have time, I'd, I'd like to return to electoral or finance reform is, is certainly, you do mention that that is, uh, that is one of the, the primary things we can do to uh, 
uh, at the moment to to address the harm that's being done to to our atmosphere. But but moving on to to a more international context, Asia or more specifically China, um, since even since you 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 published your book has has risen to to a, a a place of, of global preeminence on the certainly in the world economic stage, but uh, what's more has its carbon emissions have simply skyrocketed to to um, roughly thirty percent of the global the global carbon footprint at the moment. At least that was uh, the, those were the figures in two thousand eighteen. Now, China, as as I'm sure you know, has has recently committed to carbon neutrality by two thousand sixty. It's it's laid out. It's laid out policy in its in its uh, 14th five-year plan that's conducive to to that trend, and I wonder what your thoughts would be on on the suggestion that perhaps the United States, in a way, has lost the opportunity to to assume a role in international leadership to to curb carbon emissions. So it's a great question. Um, International leadership, we've had none under um, President Trump because he withdrew um, America from the Paris climate. And obviously, President Biden will uh, put America back in the first day in office or soon thereafter. So there's that moral leadership. But um, as a practical matter, let me just speak as a practical matter. Right now, um, the United States of America is the number one exporter of fossil fuels in the world, uh, oil and natural gas. President Trump came in with a vision of developing billions and billions of dollars of America's fossil fuels and opening up all of these publicly owned areas. Wealth that you and I own as, as Americans with our fellow citizens, wealth that is in the public trust. He opened all that out and did exactly what is antithetical to the public trust. He gave it to private corporations and is still doing that and is trying to make a push to get it out to the fossil fuel industry before he leaves office. So the United States of America actually holds a huge economic lever because we are the major exporter of these fossil fuels now and we have been for four years or more. So if we, um, if, if we clamp down and stop the flow of oil and natural gas, which we will, then the world has to do something in response. They have to change to renewable energy. South Korea is a really good example. I gave a keynote there about a month ago uh, by Zoom. And I pointed out that um, 12 or more export, major export facilities were proposed along the Pacific Northwest coast. Um, that's my region. And they came up out of nowhere in the Obama administration and then um, it carried through in the Trump administration. Over a dozen major export facilities to get these massive amounts of coal, oil, natural gas from the interior of America through the Pacific Northwest. We were the gateway, identified gateway to Asian markets which are unlimited. Asian markets are huge. <clears throat> and the people of the Pacific Northwest, my region, rose up and swarmed every single one of those projects. And not one of them has been put through, not one. And so what was deemed an industrial gateway by the industry identified as such has become a chokehold. And I believe if you look at the trends, that will continue. I believe citizens will swarm each and every one of these development projects. And that means that the number one exporter of oil and natural gas is going to turn into something very different. And that means other um, nations will have to respond. Well, South Korea was supposed to be the major recipient of natural gas coming through our area. And now South Korea has sort of seen the writing on the wall and is switching to renewable energy goals. <clears throat> and because the United States is the number one export of these fossil fuels, countries like South Korea that is entirely dependent on fossil fuels will have to very quickly reorganize this energy system and, and go with renewable energy because its supply lines will dry up if citizens are successful in this country and other countries, and I believe they will be, in stopping the flow of fossil fuels. 
So in that respect, even though America has not been a political leader in the world, the citizens have recognized the power um, of grassroots activism and shutting down fossil fuels that will stop the flow of fossil fuels to other countries. Yeah, that's, that's so powerful. You mentioned, you mentioned relocalization as, as a movement that, that starts from grassroots and that seems to, um, to coalesce with much of what you say, um, particularly in, um, in ARL as well, in atmospheric recovery litigation as to the necessity for this sort of thing to occur on a, on a, at a local level, at a regional level. So this is just a musing of mine. I wonder if you might have some insight on this as to whether legal precedent or legal, legal structures exist to hold the same, the government's, the government structures accountable, not only for their permits to, to carbon, to fossil fuel industries, but but what's more to the subsidizations that occur there and, and, and perhaps to, to shift because hundreds of billions of, of dollars um, have, been, have been funneled into, massive amounts of money have been funneled into subsidizing uh, carbon, the very, the, very, the very carbon emissions that will undermine the democracies in, in which they're occurring. Um, and that being said, I, I wonder if, on the other hand, subsidization may be the the economic endpoint for for the sustainable and local sustainable development that that you you were talking about and and, and also the local grassroots campaigns to 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 fight back um, and if so is there a legal mechanism to to achieve this this sort of political change well i think you raise a great point now subsid you know law has different levers and some take a whole lot longer than others and are more complicated or are more behind the scenes. So if, if you try to change a regulatory system, that's gonna be a long haul. That is regulations just drain energy, take a long time, they, they lead to politicization. Very, very difficult. It's like trudging through you know, quick mud. All sorts of problems with the regulatory structures. But subsidies, are like a light switch. If you can switch from fossil fuel subsidies to renewable energy and relocalization subsidies, <clears throat> you have suddenly just um, created a game changer with very little effort um, in terms of a legal tool. In other words, subsidies <coughs> don't require enforcement for the most part. It's just putting the money somewhere else. So it's not like regulations. It doesn't require you know, nearly as much administrative <clears throat> support. And so I do think if you could flip that switch from fossil fuel and nuclear subsidies to renewable energy and localization programs, you would get the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, for, from a citizen's point of view, because if the citizens can hone in on that one thing, then it's not like a regulation that they constantly have to be vigilant about and go through all these processes and where there's, you know, dark, deep statutory canyons where they may fall into two years down the road and not realize it. It's, it's just very quick and immediate. So I really, really urge that as a tactic. Whether or not there's a legal way to um, create it or force it, um, Basically, I think you just, it, it's the argument the citizens have to make. Why are you using our money, our taxpayer money, to destroy the public trust? That is, is not fiduciary care. It's just simply not. A fiduciary must invest in restorative enterprise. So it's that argument, whether or not it could you know, be turned into a court case, I haven't really thought that out at all, but certainly the compelling argument for letters to the editor, for testimony, for letters to Congress people, it's right there and it's very simple. Um, simplicity means speed. And so I always urge citizens to go after the simple low hanging fruit right in front of them. What are those levers where if you could change this one thing, it would be quick and it would create monumental change. It's not going to be 
reviving some Obama regulation. Um, the quick change has to be system change. There's only a few regulations out there that I think citizens um, could really devote themselves to. The regulatory arena is, is um, very complicated, very time consuming, and, um, and isn't like the subsidies. So yeah, subsidies are, are a great tool. Great. Well, the way you, you, you phrased your answer and, and also the, the importance that you attributed to, to the citizen level, again, um, which, which seems to be a constant theme throughout um, both your, your book and, and your thought, is, is ties in with a concept that you, you write about, which is uh, ecological religious synergy. And, and what's more, the, the individual level of analysis and of action to to proceed in in solving these issues. So this reminds me of and and we've been speaking for for an over an hour. Or so I, this this would will lead me into my final question um, of a of a quote by Malcolm Gladwell, which you which you mention uh, and which you which you insert at the end of your of Nature's Trust. And he talks about a tipping point and says that the world around us may seem like a, an open quote, immovable, implacable place. Um, and he says that it is not. With the slightest push in just the right place, it can be tipped, close quote. So that being said, um, in, in what form, here in 2020 and, and soon to be 2021, in what form of action and speech in this moment of political upheaval, of economic dissolution, um, we've even mentioned the fact that we now stand at a, an impasse where with an administration that can reconstruct the, the statutory law surrounding, surrounding environmental regulation and rather than simply putting them back in place. At this moment, what and where can nature's trust as an idea, as an ethical idea, religious idea, and uh, as a citizen's movement find its tipping point? That's a great question. Um, let me preface it and then I'll answer it. I'll, I'll, I'll end with the citizen because I do believe citizens are government. <laughs> citizens create government and we've lost sight of the notion of civic duty. Um, in prior generations, everybody knew that part of their duty as a human being in the United States of America was, was being a guardian of democracy. And um, over time, the citizen got derailed by corporations to be a consumer rather than a citizen. And a consumer spends his or her time or their time going through malls and getting the best deals and shopping, 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 shopping. A consumer is completely occupied on Black Friday. Um, that's, that's kind of a new thing. After World War II, um, for a long time, people knew democracy could be lost. It always had to be safeguarded. And so part of a person's duty, not only to their um, family, to their church, to their community, a part, part of a person's duty was just civic duty, keeping track of government. So um, where will nature's trust align with broader institutional uh, momentum. I think you mentioned the churches and I just want to reflect on that momentarily and, and then leave it with the citizen. Um, churches are an amazing force in society and in the climate crisis. Um, there, there is a whole group of interfaith, um, religious and spiritual institutions that have made climate a number one priority. And if you think of a standard church, it serves as a spiritual beacon and a moral compass to a lot of people, perhaps hundreds. And it is also a community where people get together and they have common purpose. They also have incredible organization. I mean, just as a practical matter, they have um, a, certain, a certain bit of time from hundreds of people. And they have lists, they have email lists, they have phone lists, they have organization. 
and they have kitchens and they have regular meetings. And so what we're seeing in this group of interfaith um, institutions is an integration of the, the principle that, um, that, that nature is sacred, that it is a sacred endowment, a God-given endowment, not for one generation to use and exploit and destroy, but for the perpetuity of the sacred lineage of humanity. And when you get that going, which it is, um, you, you have a potential tipping point right there. Um, not the only one, because not everybody is a member of a religious institution, but you have a major force in society. Now, coming back to the citizen, what I would say is that people often think, especially your generation, you know, I teach students every term and I get a new set of students every term. And I think the number one barrier that people of your generation have is this feeling that's hopeless. You can't save the world. And so don't even try. <laughs> All the time I get that. I can't save the world. This is out of my control. So don't even try. And I tell them two things. One is that this is like pushing a big boulder up a mountain. The more people that get behind that boulder, the quicker it's going to get to the top of the mountain. And the boulder means, it's, it's really the decarbonization, the elimination of the fossil fuel industry, that alone will transform society in, in incredible ways. Um, but the more people that get behind it in whatever way, the faster it'll get there. And then once it gets to the top and you push it over, that boulder's gonna roll. And there's going to be so much momentum. It's going to be a transformation of society where you're going to see people everywhere in every walk of life, every background engaged in this common effort to protect and restore our home. It's going to be much greater than the World War II effort. You're not going to believe it. And it's going to be something where you know, neighbors join with neighbors and they're going to say, what can I do? In World War II, people didn't just sit around. They just didn't say, oh, this is too big for me. No, they stepped up and they said, what can I do? And that happened in COVID until it became politicized. People all over the place were stepping up saying, what can I do? We have this incredible human resource that is not tapped for climate. And it will be. And when it's tapped, you are going to feel like you're a part of not only something big in your lifetime, but everybody's going to feel that they are part of this sacred moment on earth. We are the only ones in this position in all of human history. We, for some reason, you and I and everybody watching was just born into this moment in history where only we have the power to save this beautiful planet for not ourselves, but for future generations as well. Only us, it is a sacred moment that we wake up to every day. It should be the most inspiring thing in the world to us, to know that only we, our, our parents didn't have that, our grandchildren won't have it, it's up to us. And that makes our lives more fulfilling than you could ever dream of. And so I tell people, you know, just do something, do something, do anything, just don't do nothing. And that every single contribution matters. You know, it's going to take, it's going to take engineers, economists, poets, mothers, teachers, doctors. It's going to take everyone to save this world because as Paul Hawkins said, there's not anything in this world that doesn't have to be remade. And so everybody's going to be working for nature, your whole generation. Nature is your employer. That's what he says. And so I, I always end with saying, you can't save the world by yourself, but the world cannot be saved without you. And that is a great point to end on. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Professor Wood. Wonderful. Thank you. It's been my complete honor and keep in touch.